Okay, hello and welcome to our second online lesson. Hopefully by now everyone has had a chance to watch the previous PowerPoint on the underlying causes of the Russian Revolution. Just to recap real quick, in that lesson we learned about how a series of poor decisions by the Tsar and those governing under him, as well as a few other uncontrollable events, ultimately led to a couple of very serious consequences. Number one was a huge increase in social unrest, particularly in the number of protests and strikes that were occurring across Russia. And number two, a general loss in faith in the Tsar's ability to govern. Today we'll move on and talk about the actual events of the Russian Revolution itself, how it unfolded as well as its aftermath, um, particularly in, the, in regards to the rise of the Soviets. Now as I had briefly mentioned back when we were still meeting in person, the Russian Revolution is actually two revolutions. The February Revolution, which technically occurred in what is now March, and the October Revolution, which occurred in November. Again, tricky names. You might see them sometimes referred to as the March Revolution and the November Revolution, but they were always referred to by the Soviets and by the Russians as the February and the October Revolutions. All right, let's get right into it. So how it all began, how it all got going. On February 23rd, which is now March 8th, again, they were using the old style calendar at the time, uh, that's why the dates and the months are a little bit mixed up sometimes. But on February 23rd, old style, 1917, there was a large number of women in the streets of St. Petersburg celebrating International Women's Day. And they joined in on an ongoing strike that was in protest against food rationing that was happening as a result of World War I, which is something that we talked about a little bit in the previous lesson. If you remember, uh, the price of food had skyrocketed, there was uh, significant scarcity in food and fuel. So they were protesting against the food rationing, against the inflation and the, and the general uh, issues there. Here's a picture of some of those striking workers as well as the women who had joined them in this protest. Uh, and by the next day that protest had swelled to over 200,000 people. And again, this is happening in the capital in St. Petersburg. Now the Tsar and, or his government or the generals who was in charge uh, actually sent out soldiers to crush this protest. Some of those soldiers even had orders to fire on the crowd. Instead, they disobeyed those orders and actually mutinied and joined in on them instead. Uh, and that really set everything off. This was what got the entire thing going. With this protest growing larger and larger by the day, and with soldiers now mutinying to join that protest, Tsar Nicholas II realizes that he has no choice but to abdicate the throne, which he did on March 2nd in favor of his brother, the Grand Duke Michael, who we can see in this picture here. Now, Nicholas's son Alexei had been next in line to the throne, but it was decided that because of his hemophilia, he would be better off if they renounced his rights as well. They were afraid that if he became czar, he would be separated from his parents and from his siblings, uh, and they were very, very worried about his health and what would happen to him if that occurred. So Nicholas and the Tsarina Alexander decide to give up Alexei's right to the throne as well, whether or not they could legally do that wasn't clear. It still isn't clear. Nobody ever really addressed it because of what happened afterwards. Um, but they did, at least in, for the meantime, give up his rights in favor of Nicholas's brother, Michael. Now, Michael had some problems of his own. He had been living for years in exile in Switzerland after he married without the Tsar's permission. He had married a woman who was not seen as fit to join the Russian royal family, so the Tsar had basically forced him to leave the country, and he had only come back at the start of World War I to take up a position in the Russian army. Um, when he is told that he is the new Tsar, he actually refused the throne. He uh, said that he would only take it if there was some kind of vote or if it was decided by the people that he should be czar. That vote or anything like it, of course, never took place because with this February slash March revolution, the Russian monarchy was officially ended. They dissolved the monarchy. There was 
no vote ever taken on it. It was just kind of decided that it had to be done away with. So Michael, despite being the new heir to the throne, never actually became the czar. Um, some monarchists will claim that he ruled for a brief period of time, a day or two, but in reality he never really took the throne. And that's why Nicholas II is usually considered to be the last czar. So the Russian monarchy is replaced by a provisional government. That provisional government contained representatives from all the major political groups, um, socialists, constitutional monarchists, um, liberals, more conservative groups, pretty much all parties across the political spectrum. Uh, but it was dominated by the most moderate of groups, those kind of in the middle. Its primary leader was Alexander Kerensky. You can see him in the center of this picture. There, that man right there, if you can see this laser pointer, that is Alexander Kerensky, leader of the provisional government. Uh, and the major decision that the provisional government took was that they decided to continue with Russia's involvement in World War I. And that would prove to be very, very unpopular. Now, the other force in Russian government at the time were what was called Soviets. Now, what Soviets were, were workers' councils formed by various socialist groups. They had started creating Soviets as a way for the socialists to organize politically. And they existed in pretty much every major city in Russia. And in a lot of places, they actually had more control than the provisional government did, at least over local affairs. Originally, early on, they were dominated by moderate socialist groups, particularly those known as Mensheviks. But eventually, they would become uh, more and more taken over by more radical socialists called the Bolsheviks. So again, the Mensheviks were the more moderate socialists originally dominating these Soviets. The Bolsheviks were the more radical ones, and they took more and more control as time went on. Now, Bolshevik control over the Soviets really started to occur with the return of their leader, Vladimir Lenin. He had been living in exile in Switzerland, apparently in a small second-floor apartment next to a sausage factory. Uh, but when the Russian monarchy fell and the provisional government took over, the Germans saw an opportunity to potentially end Russian involvement in the war, which again, the provisional government up to this point had decided to continue with. And they actually went and got Lenin from Switzerland and smuggled him back to Petrograd, to St. Petersburg, in a sealed train car. Now, they kept him in that sealed train car, not because they didn't want anyone to know what they were doing, although that might have been part of it, but they actually didn't want him leaving the train and potentially spreading his radical Marxist ideas in German territory, or German-held territory, at least. So they kept him locked in this train car all the way back to St. Petersburg. Now, he returns, and this is a later painting, a kind of infamous painting of Lenin getting off the train to be greeted by all of his jubilant supporters, by all of these socialists who were so happy that he was back. Now, I said this is kind of an infamous painting of the man you can see getting off the train behind him right there. That is Joseph Stalin. Now, what's interesting about this is that Stalin was not on the train with Lenin in real life. In fact, Stalin was probably still in exile in Siberia at the time. Uh, but later in uh, the Soviet era, this painting was commissioned. I'm not sure exactly when, but it was obviously uh, during the era of Stalin's rule. And they included Stalin right behind Lenin to make it seem like Stalin had been with him, had been one of the driving forces of the whole revolution with Lenin right from the beginning. In reality, again, he was not there. Instead, there were several other prominent Soviet leaders who Stalin actually would have killed later on as part of his purges. Uh, so again, this very infamous painting later created by Stalin or by one of his supporters, 
uh, to really make it seem like he was much more involved than he really was in Lennon's return. But Lennon was really greeted by crowds like this. Uh, he was greeted very, very enthusiastically when he returned to Russia. So Lenin returns to Russia in this sealed train car, sent by the Germans in hopes that he would help end Russian involvement in World War I. And as soon as he returns, he proves that that hope was well-founded. He begins promising the people peace, land, and bread, meaning an end to Russia's unpopular involvement in World War I, the redistribution of land from wealthy landowners and aristocrats to the poor peasants, who had often been forced off that land, or at least forced to pay extremely high rents, and an end to food rationing uh, and the skyrocketing prices. Now, as support for the Bolsheviks grows, particularly in the Soviets, um, Lenin starts to issue his famous call, All Power to the Soviets. It kind of becomes a very famous and well-known slogan associated with Lenin. Uh, and again, as the Bolsheviks really seize control of all of these Soviets, as they gain more and more influence in Russian society, Lenin starts to call for all power to the Soviets. So that call helps set off what would later be called Red October, or the October Revolution, which again really happened in what is now November, uh, but due to a different calendar, it was still considered October by the Russians at the time. A failed summer offensive in World War I had led to even more casualties. Again, Russian involvement in that war was already incredibly unpopular. People had expected the provisional government to withdraw from that war. Uh, when they didn't, uh, they really lost a great deal of support. People became more and more unhappy, and that only grew as the casualties continued to pile up. On October 25th, which again is now November 7th, Bolshevik Red Guards, which were essentially paramilitary groups formed by the socialist Soviets, uh, occupied several important government buildings in Petrograd, in St. Petersburg. Then on the following day, they moved in and took over control of the Winter Palace. The Winter Palace had been the official headquarters of the provisional government. Now, this is a picture of a later restaging of what happened at the Winter Palace. The Soviet Union would later refer to this event as the storming of the Winter Palace. And they would create this massive reenactment. It was a mass spectacle that they filmed and that they really used for prop propaganda and publicity that made it look far more dramatic than it actually was. Even again, that just that name, you know, the storming of the Winter Palace makes it sound like this spontaneous reaction where all of these people rushed in there and overthrew the provisional government. Uh, in reality, it was far more anticlimactic. They had surrounded the palace. They had complete control of the area. They were kind of all just standing around, not sure what to do. The provisional government was meeting inside, kind of realized that it was over. Kerensky, their leader, actually snuck out the back and hopped in a car and drove away and managed to escape. The rest of them were just kind of left standing there when the Red Guards and other Bolshevik supporters burst in and basically just said, the provisional government is dissolved and you're all arrested. To which they basically just shrugged and said, okay, fine. Uh, again, this is pretty much a bloodless coup. There was a few deaths, but not much. It was not a very, uh, you know, intense event. And very, it was very anticlimactic. So with the provisional government overthrown and the Bolsheviks now firmly in power, Lenin immediately set about making some significant changes. Firstly, he fulfilled his promise and ordered the redistribution of land to the peasants and that control of factories be given to the workers. Now, that didn't mean a complete free-for-all and that they got direct control. That would usually mean that control was given over to the local Soviets, uh, which again were, in theory at least, made up of all of these workers, all of these peasants, uh, so that they could decide 
collectively what would be best done with all that land and with those factories. Lenin also issued a call for socialist uprisings in all of the other nations involved in World War I. Now, that's something that never really happens. There were a few uh, uprisings or attempted uprisings, particularly at the end of the war in a couple of countries, most notably in Germany, um, but they never really get off the ground, or at least they certainly don't achieve the success that they had in Russia, where they managed to take full control. Uh, no successful socialist uprising really occurs anywhere else in Europe. Uh, lastly, and perhaps most notably, Lenin also agrees to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with Germany. And that treaty ends Russian involvement in World War I, which again had been hugely unpopular. Uh, and in that treaty, Russia, in return for peace, had agreed to give up massive amounts of land. Now, Lenin didn't mind making this treaty and giving up all that land because in his mind, in the minds of the Bolsheviks, uh, there would soon be socialist uprisings in Germany and the other countries, and eventually everything would just become one great big socialist paradise where the borders would be completely irrelevant. So in his mind, he can give up all this land now because in a few years they'll get it all back anyways when their new socialist paradise comes about. Now, the Bolshevik takeover of Russia did not go unopposed, and a Russian civil war actually developed fairly quickly, with the opponents of the Bolsheviks banding together to form what they called the White Army, which opposed the Red Army that had been formed by the Bolsheviks and was led by Leon Trotsky. Once World War I officially ended, the U.S. and several other Western nations actually sent aid to the White Army, mainly in the form of supplies, weapons, ammunition, food, so on. Um, I do believe there were some soldiers sent as well, mainly in the form of volunteers. I'm not 100% sure of that, but the West did try and send aid to the White Army. Here we have a map of the Russian Civil War, at least its early phase. The entire area in red was the region of Russia controlled by the Bolsheviks at uh, the start of the war in February 1918. And the area in dark red, just that central area, was the area they had been pushed back to by the summer of 1918. So as you can see, the White Army actually did make significant gains at first, did manage to take back large regions, large uh, chunks of land from the Bolsheviks. But ultimately, this civil war would last until 1920, and the White Army eventually lost, as I'm sure everybody knows at this point. The Soviets, the Bolsheviks, did remain in control of Russia, went on to form the Soviet Union, the USSR. Now, the reason for the Whites' defeat was mainly due to their lack of unity, whereas the Red Army was composed you know, entirely of Bolsheviks and their supporters. The White Army was made up of literally anyone who opposed the Bolsheviks, so you had monarchists, you had moderates, you had the Mensheviks who were still, you know, relatively speaking, pretty far, you know, left on the socialist scale. You had other moderate socialists. You had literally anybody who did not want to see the Bolsheviks win. Uh, and although it's called the White Army, in reality, it was several different armies all just fighting the Bolsheviks with varying degrees of coordination and cooperation. At one point, the Whites had three different armies in the field actually fighting the Red Army. So again, lack of coordination, a lack of unity, central command, ultimately helped uh, the Red Army beat the White Army and win the Civil War. Another unfortunate consequence of the Russian Civil War was the murder of the Romanovs, the Russian royal family. Now, Nicholas II and his family were originally detained by the provisional government, who treated them fairly well. They were moved around quite a bit, but, you know, their needs were met. They were allowed outside. Um, they certainly didn't live in the standard that they were used to, but on a whole, things weren't that bad for them. There was also some consideration being given 
uh, to evacuating them to Britain, where King George V was Nicholas's first cousin. Um, planning was apparently pretty advanced for it before, at the last minute, the British government decided against it. Uh, exactly why isn't clear. It's thought, though, that they were afraid that if they rescued the Tsar and he and his family were allowed to settle in Britain, the revolution might spread to Britain. Um, whether or not that had any basis in reality is hard to say. Probably not. Um, but that seems to be what spooked them and prevented them from rescuing the Tsar. And as a result, when the Bolsheviks took power, um, they gained control over Nicholas and his family. They continued to be moved around a little bit uh, before ultimately being settled in a place called the Ipatiev House in Ekaterinburg. Uh, that's a city pretty far to the east. I think it's in the Urals. It might be marked on that map on the previous page. I believe it is. Um, they were held in much uh, tighter confinement there. No one was really allowed to see them at all. The Soviets, the Bolsheviks referred to the Apatiev house as the house of special purpose. Um, you know, and again, conditions for the family really deteriorated once they uh, fell under the control of the Bolsheviks. Um, ultimately, the White Army began advancing on the city, and the Bolsheviks began to grow afraid that the Tsar and his family would fall into their hands and be used as, uh, as a symbol to rally around uh, in you know, to encourage opposition to the Bolsheviks. So what was ultimately decided and what ultimately happened was on the night of July 16th through 17th, 1918, the family was told that they were going to be moved to a safer location, but that first a picture had to be taken of them and their servants to prove that they were all still alive. They were gathered together in a room in the basement in their night clothes with just some some large heavy coats on. Um, the Tsarevich Alexei and the Tsarina Alexandra were apparently given uh, chairs to sit on, uh, but shortly after everyone was gathered in this room, an execution squad was brought in. Um, their leader was a high-ranking uh, member of the local Bolshevik party. He apparently read out uh, an order proclaiming that they had been um, sentenced to death by the local Soviet. The Tsar had just enough time to react in confusion and surprise before um, the soldiers opened fire on the family. Um, again, exactly what happened is kind of hard to determine because there aren't a whole lot of sources about it. Um, it seems that most of the children survived the initial shots, probably because they had large amounts of gems diamonds, sapphires, and so on, sewn into the lining of their coats that actually deflected a lot of the bullets. Um, unfortunately, that didn't save them. They were still all killed in the end. Uh, for years, there were rumors that uh, at least one or two of the children had escaped. Most of those rumors um, centered around the Grand Duchess Anastasia, the Tsar's daughter Anastasia. Uh, for years, a woman named Anna Anderson uh, tried to claim that she was Anastasia. Uh, it grew to be a, a pretty well-known rumor. Um, we now know that it was not true. In 1991, um, the family's remains were discovered, and DNA testing has proven that it was them. All of the bodies are accounted for. Um, initially, Alexa and the Grand Duchess, or sorry, Alexi and the Grand Duchess Maria's bodies were missing but they were later found uh, a little bit separate from the rest. So we do know for a fact now that the entire family was unfortunately killed that night. Um, and the murders didn't stop just with them. Sorry, real quick to go back. This is actually a picture of the room that they were killed in, taken by the Soviets a short time thereafter. The house has now been demolished. Um, it was demolished by the Soviets, obviously, because they didn't want any sort of memorial to the crime that they had committed there. Uh, you can see the damage to the walls and the floors done by the bullets. Um, but that is a picture of the room that they were killed in. Uh, as I was saying, unfortunately, the killing didn't stop with the immediate royal family. Other members of the Romanov family were killed as well, including the Grand Duke Michael, um, several other Grand Dukes, Grand Duchesses. Um, 
A few members of the family did manage to escape. The Tsar's mother and a few of his cousins were ultimately evacuated by the British on one of their battleships. Um, they settled in Western Europe. Some of their descendants are still living there today in France, in Britain. Um, I think there's even a few of them here in the United States, possibly. Um, but most of the high-ranking members of the family were killed uh, either that night or very shortly thereafter. All right, stepping away briefly from the events of the uh, revolution itself, I want to talk a little bit about the differences between uh, Marx and Lenin. Um, this is important just kind of to know because while Lenin was heavily influenced by the theories of Karl Marx, by communism, um, he did differ in a few areas, particularly in how communism was to be applied to Russia. So here I have just a quick little kind of chart uh, comparing the two and their ideas. So Karl Marx believed that the communist revolution would be led by industrial workers, whereas Lenin felt that peasants were to be the driving force behind the revolution. So Marx thought it would start in the city, Lenin always thought that it would be best in a place that had a lot of rural peasants, which was certainly the case in Russia. Uh, Marx believed that the revolution would be carried out spontaneously by the workers, that ultimately conditions would just reach such a boiling point that the workers would all rise up and overthrow the bourgeoisie uh, and create a dictatorship of the proletariat. Lenin, on the other hand, believed that that couldn't occur unless uh, a the successful revolution had the guidance of professional revolutionaries. You needed, I think they called it a, a vanguard. You needed a group of dedicated revolutionaries to encourage uh, and really get the revolution started. Marx believed that after the revolution occurred, uh, the working class, the proletariat would then work uh, democratically together and share all of the wealth. Lenin, on the other hand, thought that the country would then have to be run by a single political party to ensure that goals are met. So Marx thought that everyone would just kind of live together and mutually and collectively decide things, whereas Lenin recognized that you did have to still have some kind of leader, some sort of government, and the best form for that would be a single political party. Uh, lastly, Marx thought that the change to communism would be a very rapid thing. This revolution would occur, and then this dictatorship of the proletariat, this democratic, you know, um, coexistence of the workers would start right away. Whereas Lenin realized that even though the revolution might happen quickly, the shift to full communism to everyone kind of living in this utopia together would take a much, much longer time. Now, uh, Lenin did want to spread communism throughout the entire world, um, and he did make that spread official Soviet policy, uh, and to help that spread created a organization called uh, the Communist International, or Comintern, to fund and to train revolutionaries in other countries. Again, this is kind of separate from all the events of the revolution itself, but I did want to, you know, highlight the beliefs of Marx and Lenin and where they differed a little bit. All right, jumping back into things. Once the Bolsheviks took control of Russia, they obviously made some significant changes to the government. Russia was divided up into several different Soviet republics. Uh, if you think of that map that I gave you with all those different countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, each of those was technically a separate Soviet Republic, and they were all united in a larger, I guess you'd call it a federation, uh, called the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And that was the official name for Russia during the entire you know, Soviet era, the USSR. And the way that the new Soviet government worked, at least on a national level, was like this. 
uh, the members of local Soviets, so let's say, for example, in a city somewhere, would elect members to serve on larger regional Soviets, regional councils in each republic. So each republic would have its own kind of regional Soviet. And those regional Soviets would send delegates from each republic to what was called the Supreme Soviet, the National Soviet, for all of these different republics. The Supreme Soviet would then elect uh, what was known as the Central Committee. And that Central Committee's job was basically to rubber stamp laws and choose the Politburo. The Politburo being short for Political Bureau. Now, the Politburo was the most important group in this entire system uh, because it contained the highest ranking members of the Communist Party and was the, they were the ones making the actual decisions. Um, a couple of other notes. The Bolshevik Party was officially renamed the Communist Party in 1922, and that was when uh, the name of Russia was officially changed to the USSR. So Lenin led Russia through all of these changes and the formation of the Soviet Union, but he didn't live for too long after that. Uh, he suffered three different strokes between 1922 and 1923 that are believed to have been caused by the enormous amounts of stress he was under as a result of all these events, successfully leading the revolution, uh, the hardships of the Civil War, and then forming a new government um, had severely damaged his health. There had also been several assassination attempts against him, and as a result of these strokes, by March 1923, he was pretty much completely mute and bedridden. Uh, and he would ultimately die on January 21st, 1924. And because he was such an important figure and such a hero to the people of the Soviet Union, they embalmed his body and put it on permanent display in Red Square in Moscow. It is still there today. Lenin's mausoleum still exists. You can still go there and see his body on display exactly as you can see it in this picture right here. Um, even though we're coming up on close to 100 years since he died, and even though the Soviet Union has long since ceased to exist, he is still on display today, and as far as I know, there are no plans to take him off display. So if you want, if you're ever in Moscow, go stop by and see the body of Lenin on display. Once it had become clear that Lenin wasn't going to live much longer, a power struggle had developed over who should succeed him as the primary leader of the Soviet Union. The two contenders for that position were Joseph Stalin and Leon Trotsky. Now, in January 1923, shortly before he became bedridden, Lenin had actually written a paper in which he praised both Stalin and Trotsky for their contributions to the revolution, but also criticized both of them. He felt that Trotsky was too overconfident and arrogant, but also that Stalin was untrustworthy and had already been given too much power. He actually went so far as to suggest that Stalin should be removed from his position as Secretary General of the Communist Party. Um, Trotsky had for years been viewed as Lenin's most likely heir, mainly because he had been the successful commander of the Red Army during the Civil War, and because he was a well-known communist philosopher. Uh, Stalin, however, had an advantage over Trotsky uh, in being the Secretary General of the Communist Party. Despite Lenin's warning, Stalin was never removed from that position, and as a result, he was able to put his allies in key positions. Uh, and because he was able to successfully organize his followers and put them in those positions, once Lenin died, Stalin quickly seized power for himself and basically forced Trotsky out. He increasingly attacked Trotsky, marginalized him, and ultimately forced him into exile where he would later be assassinated on Stalin's orders. And we will uh, learn a little bit more in our next lesson uh, about Stalin, about the ways that he uh, took power and the ways that he maintained power. One of, one of if not the most uh, ruthless figure
in the entire 20th century, probably. Again, we'll learn more about him in our next lesson.